So welcome to this uh, Google Hangout that is part of the Coursera course, uh, Terrorism and Counterterrorism, Comparing Theory and Practice. And in this Google Hangout, we'll focus on uh, Islamic State, the organization called Islamic State. It goes under different names, uh, partly because it's a sensitive name, Islamic State, Daesh, Islamic State in, uh, in Iraq and uh, Syria. And we're going to talk about foreign fighters. We're going to do that with uh, four participants of this course, uh, uh, three students and one of the forum moderators. And we're going to do that with you, um, those that watch this uh, video by way of uh, the YouTube channel um, can um, uh, contribute to the discussion by uh, um, uh, posing questions through the YouTube video. And my assistant, Janine de Roy van Zuinderwijn, will have a look and see what questions are relevant to the current debate. And she will uh, let me know uh, while we're having this discussion with four people. Um, uh, Jason, uh, uh, Cynthia or Evrat, uh, um, Louisa and uh, Darren. Uh, let me introduce them uh, to you. First, uh, Jason uh, Lafive, uh, who is from Canada. Uh, who is a, has a background in law enforcement, a background in police studies, uh, criminal justice, has a, a, had a career or has a career in, uh, in policing 12 years, four years in the Canadian Army. Then we have Efrat Hussein, who is from, uh, who was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, residing in the state of Tennessee in the U.S., uh, graduated uh, in 2007. Um, Paralegal Studies at the City University of New York, and you're an entrepreneur with a background in transportation. Um, so interesting, different background. Uh, and then we have um, Louise van Gent, who is uh, one of the course uh, or the forum moderators, uh, a Dutch student in international relations from a in historical perspective at Utrecht University. And Janine is also a graduate from that same uh, excellent uh, study here in, in the Netherlands and has a bachelor degree in, uh, in history, writing her thesis on European counterterrorism policy in the 1970s. I'm looking forward to, uh, to read that, uh, in fact. Uh, and you, were, uh, you contributed to this MOOC in several uh, ways, so thank you for that. And uh, finally, Darren. Begley, um, nationality says Scottish, so I wonder what he voted uh, in the last uh, elections in Scotland where they had to decide about the future of, uh, of Scotland. Maybe you want to share that yes. with us already. It's too sensitive. Oh, it's thumbs up. Uh, so you're, <laughs> you were maybe a bit disappointed with the uh, final results. And maybe that's the reason why you're now based in Japan. I'm not sure. Uh, you're a teacher there. Educational background in uh, politics and history and studying for your master's in international education, um, part-time working. So great to have you uh, all um, uh, to be part of this uh, Google Hangout. And the first question uh, I would like to give the floor to, to Darren. Uh, please, if you um, uh, state your question, and then I'll uh, either um, react shortly or I'm definitely going to ask the others first to react. So Darren, what was your question? OK, uh, my question was um, to what extent was ISIS created in response to anger and frustration at the policies pursued by Western governments? And by Western governments, I mean like the United States, the United Kingdom. And to what extent can we say that ISIS is such a threat that it currently is today because of the actions of, of these governments. Thank you. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent question. Uh, a sensitive one to a lot of policymakers in the West, uh, but one that is raised uh, not only by uh, people with a Muslim background, but many people in the West as well. Uh, interestingly, you came up with this question um, while well, at the same time uh, President Obama said a, a number of remarkable things on this issue, this again sensitive issue, especially from uh, U.S. perspective, I guess. He said uh, a few days ago in an interview with Vice News, he said two things. One is ISIL is a direct outgrowth of Al-Qaeda in Iraq that grew out of our invasion. So he, he, he assumes a causal relationship between these two things. And he also said in that same interview, which is an example of unintended consequences, 
which is why we should generally aim before we shoot. Um, I think a remarkable uh, statement. I'm not sure if it's in support of your question, uh, but it is an important question. To what extent is ISIS, IS, Islamic State, a result of U.S. and Western foreign policy in the region? Who well, may I uh, give the floor for a first reaction or some some thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Lisa? Uh, any, anyone is okay. I, I, anyone is welcome to answer. I don't want to put another student in a in a difficult position. <laughs> well, who may I give the, the floor? Uh, Evrat? Yeah, sure, please. Evrat, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Um, as a Muslim, I might of my uh, uh, people that really follow my face do will argue that yes, it is a response to it. Uh, as a responsible Muslim, I do believe that this is biased because um, the issue that a, per, a foreign country invade another country do not give any motive to uh, evolve into violence and to attack country in a name of a religion, which is doesn't or never have a promote uh, violence against another country. I do believe that um, maybe it's an excuse that they are using uh, with the sole purpose to commit these crimes uh, against other humans and basically try to uh, enforce their doctrines and their beliefs to other people that do not share the same, uh, the same religion or the same uh, doctrines. I think that uh, it's a double standard in this. It might seem like it's a response, but personally as a Muslim, I do not believe that it's a response. It was my school. Uh, thank you. Um, Louise, may I give you the floor perhaps? Uh, what's your take on this? Yeah, well, I think I have to agree with Efrat. Um, I think Western governments may have um, caused the uh, created the conditions for IS to uh, rise in uh, this region but it is always um, well this is my opinion from a moral uh, perspective that it's always the choice of IS and the uh, fighters over there to choose violence and um, even though the Western governments didn't make it any easier for them in the region and dis destabilized uh, the region very much it is still the choice of the people over there to use violence or not. So, yeah, partly the Western governments uh, are to blame, but still, um, I think the problems over there are more complicated than that. Also, we have a lot of sectarian uh, issues over there, so it's not only the Western uh, world to blame. So that's my point of view. Thank you. Yeah, interestingly, of course, uh, a lot of people blame that same Western government for not uh, invading Syria and getting rid of Saddam, of, uh, of the Assad regime. So there's always uh, this, this problem: should you do something, you're damned if you don't, you're damned if you do, or the other way around. Uh, so it, 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 it is difficult, but I think it's it's important that Obama said there is a relationship, uh, unintended side effect. Uh, but it's definitely, um, I think, a good thing that he at least hinted at the fact that that we, the West, uh, are partly to blame for the situation over there. And uh, maybe I understand it as uh, also a motivation to continue to make sure that we don't leave these people alone and try to help them to create stability. Uh, while really thinking over the possible negative uh, consequences of our presence over there. So, uh, uh, an interesting statement. Maybe, Darren, you would like to uh, add something? Uh, yeah, um, well, I, I sort of some interesting points from the, the other students. Um, it's really, the way I sort of see it when I look at it is that um, the the whole growth of ISIS and its strength has sort of been born out of of uh, over aggressive Western policy towards the Middle East. Maybe to the extent that, like, um, the, the the growth of ISIS has kind of like 
maybe like the the Frankenstein of of this policy, of of, of its its a its pursuit of uh, how it behaves in the Middle East, and yeah, perhaps maybe uh, as Efrat said, some maybe some people will use this as an excuse. Some people will use it as their as their excuse to to justify their their violent actions. But I would also suggest that in in an argument to that, I think that um when when we see such aggression from from the United States and from Britain and from their other allies in in the Middle East, many people I, I would believe are are sort of left with a feeling of frustration and they have not no other way to to express their their uh, opposition to to what's happening. Maybe they don't feel that they they are represented by the the governments which are put in place. Um, so. I, well, I understand that. Yeah, it might be an excuse for some people uh, to to justify the use of violence. I think that to an extent, there has to be an element where you have to sort of suggest that. I, I think maybe some people are would maybe not maybe people are not violent per se, but people maybe some people in the country or in these countries would would support ISIS because they feel there's no other way to represent their their desire or their will. Or their agenda, maybe is a better word. So maybe they don't really wish the violence to be continued at such an extreme rate, but they feel maybe they have nothing else to, no other way to express support for their their beliefs. Maybe. Uh, sorry, thank you. Uh, of course, it depends like how you um, want how you want to raise your issue on the agenda and, and using the type of violence IS is using of course is I think and I think we can all agree uh, unacceptable uh, uh, outrageous and, and maybe then I'll, I'll, I'll move on to uh, to, to Jason uh, uh, your question also related or starts with uh, this committing of war crimes uh, the way IS is um, uh, behaving in the region in Syria, Iraq. Uh, today, actually, they um, um, said that they were behind the attack in Tunisia that killed about 20 people, and they were very proud uh, that they uh, did what they did. And uh, this is not only unacceptable to the West, but also many other countries face this problem. And your question relates to uh, also to IS. So, Jason, may I give you the floor? I, I, I cannot see you anymore, but I hope you're still out there. I hope he'll he will come back. <laughs> I could uh, for, uh, well what I could do is uh, of course uh, formulate his question, uh, uh, hoping that he will uh, pop up and he will um, he will hear us. Um, so Jason was asking since IS has been accused by the United Nations of committing war crimes uh, on a massive scale, and there has been uh, has been since uh, allegations that similar acts have been committed by other factions involved in this conflict. Would it not be appropriate at this point for the United Nations or similar coalition of, of nations to commit additional forces? So currently we have these uh, airstrikes. And so aside from airstrikes and special operation advisors currently on the ground in an effort to finally bring stability to that region and prosecute those responsible for the atrocities committed. So the idea of boots on the ground. Um, who may I give the floor? Louise, what do you think of the idea that we should step up uh, the, um, let's say, kinetic or military approach towards IS since they continue their atrocities, uh, not only killing people, but also um, uh, this, this archaeological gen genocide, uh, uh, destroying uh, age-old buildings uh, that are so much part of, of, of world civilization. What do you think? Well, I think we, uh, or the United Nations has to do something. Um, uh, the Coalition of the Willing is, is starting to do some airstrikes and things, and uh, I think that's not sufficient enough to, uh, well, let's put it harsh, destroy IS. Um, I think we have to step up and um, help people, and that means we have to put boots on the ground as well, not 
just uh, staying out of the region uh, or um, uh, let it over to the partners uh, or in the region itself like uh, Lebanon and stuff like that we have to I think it is as a liberal country it's more like a liberal perspective in the international relations we have to um, live up to the human rights we have and what's the point of having all these conventions in human rights if we don't act on it so yes we have to uh, take responsibility and do something uh, whether it is on boots on the ground or not uh, what they are doing now is not sufficient enough the coalition of the willing of course not the UN, UN but I think they have to step up thank you uh, yeah responsibility responsibility to protect uh, that seems like an empty phrase now that was a big word uh, 10 years ago and now we see these things happening um, acts committed, crimes committed by IS, at the same time we see crimes by the Assad regime and we're just standing there and saying, oh, okay, our responsibility to protect. At the same time, um, Darren mentioned the fact that um, a lot of people realize that Western military interventions or what, whatever military interventions can also in the long run cause new conflicts. So, uh, Jason, uh, great you're back. Uh, actually, I raised uh, your question, excellent question. Um, maybe, I, maybe I'll give you the floor to maybe partly answer your question uh, yourself or your first reaction and then um, go to uh, uh, Efrat to uh, see what, what is uh, her take on that. So Jason, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, and we had a first reaction by Louisa, so maybe now back to you. Thanks, sir. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, no, just a little bit of technical difficulty on my end. Um, anyway, yeah, no, I, I brought that up uh, with the with the UN. It was based based on something I'd read the other day regarding um, you know atrocities committed in uh, in in the uh, you know in, in Iraq and Syria, and it kind of ties in a little bit with the response I'd wanted to give to Darren's question regarding the measured response. Um, okay, maybe IS 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 reactionary to you know what they're doing you know to you know they're reacting to what you know the West's intervention in that region however what they're doing is not a measured response to you know like it, it's not it's not proportionate and it, at this stage of the game I mean it's not even about uh, you know a caliphate it's not about Islam it's 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 violence for the sake of violence I mean when we're reading about people being beheaded we're reading about people you know pilots being set on fire I, I read one dreadful story the other day about a, a woman who was tricked into eating her own son I mean that's terrible. That, that's that's so we have to do something. And I mean, I, I also read that there are other factions on the ground that are committing you know similar atrocities. I read that Iran is now being involved. Are we going to hold Iran accountable to the same rule of law that we that, you know? And, and are we going to indict them the same as we do IS? Or are we going to you know like when when are we going to run interference and uh, and and uh, you know ensure that things are done right. I'm, I'm really curious about that because it seems like a lot of talking is being done and not a lot's being, you know, being done to, you know, like there's, there's nothing we see, there's nothing tangible, right? So that's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at, I suppose, if that makes any sense. Well, it has the appearance that we're muddling through. Nobody wants to really take the initiative. Everybody's afraid of the side effects. Uh, of course, there is a difficulty because within the UN Security Council, there are very different opinions. So, everybody. But I think maybe even a lot of people are quite okay with the fact that it seems almost impossible to do something uh, because uh, nobody really knows what to do, uh, and everybody's afraid of negative side effects, and uh, it it has. Um, but then what's wise, you know, what's what's the smart thing to do? Just sit and wait and let them sort it out or go in and 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 do the right thing maybe for now to stop them for now. Very difficult questions, um, very frustrating to all uh, people that are, are watching this situation. Um, Efrat, what, what's your take on that? Uh, what should we do or not do? Well, I do believe that it's a complicated issue, as says the classmate. Yes, we are seeing that they are doing a, a lot of atrocities and we are just sitting down. Uh, even as Muslim scholars have condemned and they wrote an open letter, calling letter to al-Baghdadi, stating uh, under Islamic law, 
uh, what if they are doing wrong and what they are doing that is not based on Islam that he basically called himself Khalifa without the consensus of the Muslim community uh, in general. The problem when it comes to the government trying to um, go into a conflict is that according to the public international law, there is something called intervention by invitation. So basically, uh, you're the expert in this, you can correct me, uh, any country cannot go and invade another country unless the same country itself asks for help. Then the problem that we have is that ISIS being in Iraq, there is some part of the government from Saddam Hussein that they are agree with ISIS and there is other ones who are not. So which one the international community is going to listen? Are we going to listen those that is in support, those who are afraid and say, don't come, we don't want this come worst, or we need or we have the responsibility to actually protect our countries first than the affected country and lead them to basically solve their issues because it's more about religion, which is a, is a very uncomfortable situation. Well, in the case of Iraq, it's relatively simple. The Iraqi government uh, asked other countries to help them, so in that case, there's no intervention, or yeah, there is an intervention, but not definitely not an invasion. Uh, and there, it's uh, on behalf of the central government in Baghdad to restore the territory integrity of of uh, of Iraq. It's a bit of a, a different case in Syria, where there is uh, activities. And I'm, um, I guess the Damascus is not unhappy with any airstrikes against IS, but nonetheless, uh, it's a violation in their eyes of their territorial integrity. Uh, so there, the situation is a bit more difficult. Um, so it's about states, it's about maybe religion, uh, but I, I'm not so sure, as you mentioned, a lot of people say, well, IS wrongly is claiming the name Islamic State and Caliphate, so it's a sensitive thing. That's why a lot of people would not like me, for instance, to call IS, IS, uh, Islamic State, although they themselves call that way, uh, because um, they do not have the legitimacy of an Islamic State. So lots of sensitivities um, um, uh, involved in, in, in this, uh, this question. Um, maybe Darren or uh, Louisa on this, uh, should we do more? Should we have boots on the ground? Should we um, quickly go after IS the sooner the better with all means available or should we show more restraint? Um, if, I, if I may, please. Um, I, I think that, well, that's a, that's a very uh, honourable stance to take, the sort of st stepping up, if you like, or taking the, 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 the coalition of the willing and the defence of other people. I, I think that's very honourable, but at the same time, I think that the idea that more soldiers and more fighting is going to eradicate ISIS, I think that's that's insane in my opinion. I think if we look over the last, since maybe like maybe uh, post 9-11, I think the idea of using uh, the military to defeat like a, an, an ideology, which effectively is, I think, is never going to uh, is never going to win. And I think it, it's there are cases in history where that, that's been the same. Um, and I also think that um, if we look at the, um, like you said, the the archaeological damage to to buildings and to infrastructure within these countries, things things like airstrikes, I think they cause a lot more damage. Than 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 good. I think if we look at uh, um, one of the one of the, the lectures, there was a, a speech from someone from Amnesty International, talking about uh, the use of drone strikes and airstrikes in certain regions of Pakistan and Afghanistan, and the the damage caused there was, in my opinion, far more um, troublesome in terms of a future response than. Than uh, than than the the good it created, so in my opinion, I, I think we should be doing something. But I think the the use of more military force is is not the way, not the way, not the best use of our our resources. 
Thank you, Darren, for uh, sharing that with us, um, knowing that there are differences of opinion, of course, and there's also questions from the audience. So, um, Janine, may I give you the floor? Yes, thank you. Um, I got a question from Tom Buitelaar, and he's asking, uh, will IS still exist in five years, referring to this coalition of the willing and this battle against IS? Or will they uh, go down fighting, and is that maybe their sole aim to be defeated militarily? So will they exist, and is that their goal to really be defeated in a military sense? What do you think about that? Uh, good question, and a, an easy one to answer if I had my crystal ball, but I forgot it at home, so uh, let's, let's try then uh, this, kind, this answer, <laughs> starting with I don't know, uh, of course. Um, I do think that um, uh, we somehow, especially after last summer, portray IS as some kind of uh, miracle, uh, unimaginable, very strong, etc. But if we look at the battlefield situation these days, we see that they are losing grounds in parts of Iraq, um, uh, especially Tikrit area, um, uh, but also other parts of Iraq, also in Syria, in north uh, east Syria. Uh, other parts of the country, uh, Kobane uh, pocket, uh, the Kurds and, and Free Syrian Army are there uh, on the march. So we have to be careful not to make IS bigger and stronger than they are. And today they um, uh, claimed responsibility for an act, uh, the attack in Tunisia and they said this is our the first drops of a, of a, of a shower, of a, of, a, of a lot more rain. Uh, and that's, that's the way they have a huge impact on all of us, showing these atrocities. But again, Let's be careful. Um, if we look at the map of Syria and Iraq, we see large swaths of land that are colored in, in dark. This is IS country. Yeah, it is and it isn't. Uh, they need the support and they got the support of a lot of local uh, organizations, local uh, militias, uh, and they might turn their back uh, on IS also, again, uh, similar to what happened, for instance, to the Taliban in Afghanistan. So I, I do expect... Um, that IS um, is in, it will get it, it will, will uh, face a lot of difficulties in the months uh, ahead. And if they start losing support from local militias that now joined uh, the ranks of IS, uh, that might be uh, happen a, a lot faster uh, that they lose ground than, than we expect. Do I expect them to go down and, and not exist in five years' times? No, because the brand name IS is very strong. Uh, their call for action is very strong, and they got a lot of sympathizers. They got a lot of foreign fighters, so they have a worldwide audience, a worldwide network of veterans, and I think that is very worrisome. So IS on the ground, I think they can be beaten. Uh, they can lose a lot of territory, uh, but as a brand name, as an organization, as a a banner, um, uh, and 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 also a an example to others to do something. I'm afraid will be confronted with that in the years to come and even after five years from now. And that brings me maybe to the issue of foreign fighters. Um, they are an important part of IS. They are their ambassadors and a lot of people of course are worried that some of these foreign fighters when they come back to their def different countries, Tunisia, just to mention one, UK, U US, Australia, as far as China, um, that it is uh, uh, something that countries are very much worried about. And it also relates to the question by um, by Efrat. Maybe you can um, maybe we can now uh, use this uh, interesting question to move to the issue of foreign fighters. Efrat, you had a, an interesting question on that. That's why we invited you. So please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Well, my question is that if should governments prosecute brain fighters and charge them with treason, this is according to the U.S. Article Three, Section Three. Uh, which says uh, treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them and adhering their enemies, giving them aid and comfort, and no person shall be convicted of treason unless testimony of two witnesses or a confession in open court. So therefore, should governments prosecute uh, these uh, people that they are trying to do that, join them, enlist them, engage in the act, and they have the the government should have the sole authority to revoke permanently their citizenship because they are uh, threatening uh, our country. Uh, that was basically my question. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, interesting question uh, and a sensitive one that is on the agenda in many countries that, that are confronted with foreign fighters, how to treat them, are they, is this treason, does this uh, end your relationship with that country, is that possible under international law, very sensitive issues. Uh, I think we all live in countries that have suggested uh, these kind of measures or from countries, I think in the UK this has been an issue, in Canada probably. Uh, US, the Netherlands, Louisa, um, I'm sure you followed the debate on this, we just had elections in the Netherlands and this issue was brought forward as well, uh, this sensitive issue of, you know, can we uh, revoke citizenship or can we even make people stateless? Uh, can I hear you on that? Yes, um, well it's a very difficult question actually and um, I think we have to be very careful of um, prosecute these foreign fighters, uh, these girls and boys who choose to go to Syria or Iraq um, because it doesn't define them that they made a choice to go to Iraq or Syria and um, in the past we have seen that um, if we don't give them any chance anymore they radicalize even more and they get isolated and that's not what we want, we want them to de-radicalize and um, I don't think um, prosecute them for treason is the right way to um, to solve the problem um, to make them stateless is something also very difficult because you don't give them any chance and is that something we want in a free country in democracy they have the choice to go and well I can imagine people say something like that um, Get, get away, uh, let's um, bring them to Iraq or Syria, like um, uh, Abu Talab, our uh, Dutch uh, mayor from Rotterdam, says um, they have to get their passports, uh, take them away, and that's you can go to Syria if you want to. I'm not sure if that's very, it's a very good idea because they are Dutch citizens, and well, we have to tackle the problem, which is more. Uh, deeper and that's one of my questions um, as well. Um, they have a very good uh, narrative uh, IS and these boys and girls believe in that narrative so uh, it's a very deep problem and why do they want to go to Iraq or Syria? That's the bigger question and not whether they uh, are uh, prosecuted for treason or not. And, it, it doesn't define them. Everyone makes wrong choices, and some choices are more wrong than others, but it doesn't define the, the people eventually. So I think we have to tackle the problem by uh, looking into how to de radicalize these people and um, maybe help them even. So, yeah, difficult situation. Yeah, it is. There are lots of uh, restraints, legal ones. Is it possible to make people stateless uh, under a lot of national laws? That is not possible. International law, uh, there's lots of obstacles. Then the thing, is it wise? Is it smart? Uh, they might come back anyhow. I mean, you can cross these borders without a passport if you really want to. Um, and and, and is, is it proportional? Um, on the other hand, they join groups that, that, that do horrible things, but very often it's difficult to prove. So there's, there's a lot to say for that. Maybe as a symbolic reason or in, in, in a public discourse about foreign fighters, it, it serves a purpose, saying, well, if you do this, you know, you're really cutting ties with your country. But whether in the end it's, it's effective and if, it's really, if we can really implement it, that's a different question. So, there's no easy answer there. Um, uh, Efrat, what, what would be your own answer to that, uh, that question? Yes, well, uh, I, do, I do see the danger of uh, trying to prosecute someone as a treason, especially they are 16, 17 years old. But here is the standpoint of the according the law. According the law, at least in the United States, I'm not very sure if it's in, in Europe, a person that is uh, 16 years or over is capable to understand the implications that they are going through. Uh, that you try to radicalize a person 
is very rare. A person that becomes radical in their own religion, especially Islam, is very rare and very, takes a lot of work to you try to make that person understand that the views about Islam and Quran is totally distorted. That's why these people engage in this type of act of indoctrination. This is something that they are constantly battling. I even read on the news that they are over there putting uh, videos in the mosque and they are all the time constantly reminding you that this is what it says the Quran but it's not really what it says the Quran, it's their interpretation. So to you try to delete that disk from a person and make it a new reformat, maybe the hardware is going to take a lot. And then we're going to confront the problem of when these people come to this country, what about if they just lie, if this person tell them, go there, lie, say to them that you are not part anymore, and let's do something else then we are in danger of our own country. So I think that is a very sensitive issue that we are going to face. Thank you, Efrat. Uh, before I go on to, to Jason, I would like to hear you on this, uh, Jason. Uh, there's a related question from the audience about uh, uh, the threat level, uh, I think. Um, Janine, can you let us know? Yes, there's a question uh, by Ron Frederick, and he's referring to a recent article in the New York Times. And it indicates that foreign fighters within IS are mainly there for religious reasons. That's what the article says. So he says they might not even want to return. And those people that do return, maybe they're just the dropouts and they are not really uh, planning any attacks when they come back. So should we really see them as threats when they come back? And how should we, uh, well, what kind of measures should we take then? Well, maybe that's, that's a good question for uh, Jason to answer. So what should we do with these um, uh, foreign fighters that return? Are you still with the police? And is this also uh, something that's on your plate? Well, currently uh, in Canada, we're looking at... Uh, actually, this is very... The timing is, is kind of impeccable with this discussion and what's happening in my country because we're currently debating a, a terrorism bill which is going to expand the powers of police and intelligence agencies uh, you know, to arrest suspects indefinitely, to, to search. Um, there, there's a huge uh, outcry about this as well because it, the potential does exist for, you know, the infringement on civil liberties, which I, I think is, you know, reasonable to some extent. Um, it's a lot akin to the Patriot Act in the United States, uh, you know, just broadening the powers of, of, the, uh, of the rule of law. Now, um, the question is, you know, is this a case of, you know, killing a fly with a sledgehammer? Is this, uh, you know, it, what, what, what is the efficacy of something like this, right? Now, getting back to foreign fighters coming back, and I think Louise brought up a very good point, and so did Efrat, with uh, regards to, you know, okay, we have revoked these people's citizenship when, you know, going over there. Well, I'd like to expand on that by saying, well, what do we do with these people? Where do they go? I mean, if, if they can't come home, and we're, you know, it's it's... Like, suppose we do send people in there, you know, suppose stability does happen. Well, what's the end result for these people? What's the, what's the net result, right? And, and if no one can answer that question, maybe this isn't the best route to take. Um, I, I don't have the answers, obviously, but what I would suggest is perhaps it might be appropriate in this instance to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I'm not so sure I agree uh, that, that de-radicalization is completely impossible. Um, I mean, I, th I think there's some people that are that are hardliners. They're over there. They're 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 dedicated to the cause. But there's probably a lot of followers too. And if if we take a look at some of the subject matter on the course, some of the readings, uh, uh, studies done by yourself, by Janine, by other scholars about why they go over there. Well, we found that you know we we see that a lot of them are are are, are disassociated with the societies they come from. They're they're looking to belong to something. Well, if if that you know, if, if where, where, they, where they went, they don't, you know, it doesn't exist anymore, well then what, what's the net result? Where, where do they go, right? What, what happens to them? Maybe we can de-radicalize them. Um, and, and I think maybe it might be worth trying out, right? Just because, I mean, it would take a lot of money, it would take a lot of time, it would take a lot of effort, but I mean, if you look at the cost of that compared to what we might end up having to deal with later on, should we take a hard approach against them and, you know, evict them from the country, you know, we might be creating bigger problems for ourselves later. This might be an investment in, in uh, you know, averting 
similar situations are worse in the future. That, that's my take on it, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Uh, also, your remark about we have to maybe look at this from case to case. Uh, maybe that's possible for countries like uh, Canada or the Netherlands. But what about Tunisia with 3,000 people out there? That's that's also, we should also think about that foreign fighters. Especially in the West, we think of people from Europe and North Africa, of North America and, and Australia, but there are thousands uh, from other countries. And, and also these countries are very worried about this question, what to do when they return. Um, I think Ron uh, uh, quoting, uh, what was it, New York Times, uh, uh, saying that a lot of them that come back, I say to Western countries are disillusioned. That's also one of the findings of a, a unpublished study here in the Netherlands that looked into those that returned. Uh, they're not the die-hard fighters, they were, but they returned, the, um, uh, they were among the first wave to go there, and they're very disillusioned. Uh, maybe that's different for those that go now and that directly join the ranks of uh, Islamic State. And then there's also a moral question to it. Islamic State stands in my eyes for, well, it, what is it comparable uh, to, uh, probably one of, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredibly violent organization that defies all rules of all religions and international laws and, and whatever standard of decency. So we, and even if they are 16, 17, they join that group, so that, that, that remains a very difficult one. Um, on the other hand, we have old traditions, legal traditions, religious traditions, where we give people a chance to come back. And, uh, and I think we should, you know, find a balance somehow. Uh, I think if people have, uh, if, if we know of people that have beheaded people over there, have committed atrocities, I think uh, a lot of societies uh, will not even accept these people to return. Uh, but a case-to-case -case basis, I think, is probably the most the smartest and the most proportional way. Uh, but if you sometimes see these pictures and see the beheadings of some of these people that go out there to help the, the people of Syria, and you realize it's a guy from Britain, uh, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people say, well, let's, let's let make sure this guy never comes back. So it's a difficult and sensitive issue. Uh, Darren, maybe you'll have something to add to that? Uh, yeah, okay, uh, just uh, quickly, um, I think that um, what what I sort of agree with uh, Jason and, and uh, Louise to an extent, I think that um, persecuting these people or tra trying these people for these things is, is, is a, seems like, a, it might seem like a good idea on a level, but I, I think that we, we already have in most societies we have a sort of right now a sort of us and them mentality uh, and, and I think that perpetuating this 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 mentality is only going to make it a little bit a, a, a more caustic environment if you like so um, like I mean these young people who have been radicalized or or who went over to to commit to this uh, as Jason said, they already felt completely isolated, and they already felt disenfranchised from their from their communities. And I think if we come, maybe they come back, and and we continue to, you know, okay, we're going to try you under this uh, this terrorism act, and it maybe sort of to an extent maybe hardens their belief that they are being persecuted because they are uh, Muslim or because they are they have a certain uh, ideology. So I think. Um, like maybe um, Jason suggested that a sort of case by case scenario uh, has to be considered. But I think in general terms, I think the, the um, a more I look at how can we de-radicalize these people and look to sort of have a a less a less aggressive stance towards it and look towards building something more more sustainable for future rather than than maintaining a sort of hardened a hardened approach. I think the hardened approach uh, won't work in the long term. Yeah, it's good to make the decision the, the, uh, between the difference between long uh, long term and short term. Um, yeah, at the same time, um, if you again, if you see these pictures of beheadings and you know these are citizens of your country, uh, there are a number of people say, well, go out there and 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 use your military force over there to make sure to stop these people. 
uh, and kill them and, and, and make sure that they cannot do more harm over there. That's even the more, maybe you could say, the ultimate hard approach. That, of course, is a daily practice. Uh, Janine and I and, and a colleague of ours, Alistair Reed, are actually looking into pathways. And once these people are there, what are their options? To return peacefully, to return uh, home, to stage an attack, to go to other places, to try to live in that country peacefully or not. There are many different options, and, and whatever you do and whatever measure you take, uh, for instance, taking away passport or persecuting them, has an impact on their choices and their pathways. And I think we have to really think through all the different options and all the side effects of our measures. Being too hard can cause problems in, in, the, in the long run, but maybe too soft can do the same. So it, it, it's, it's very difficult uh, against a very politicized um, um, background with regard to uh, the issue of foreign fighters. So uh, we're probably not going to find answers uh, here to this uh, question. And I think it depends uh, on everybody's personal uh, opinion. And again, I think what we might agree on is that we have to look at it from a case-to-case -case basis. Those that have gone to Syria in 2013 are different people that have gone today and those that join IS are different than those that join other groups. So uh, let's take that into uh, into account. And then you have also people who join Kurdish militias and other groups, or join the ranks of the Assad regime or Iraqi militia. So the picture is so diverse uh, that there is, I guess, no general answer to this, uh, this question. Um, Louise, may I ask you to, uh, to, to again state your question? You already mentioned it, uh, but could you maybe um, uh, raise the question again and, and maybe also um, um, explain why this is an important question to you? Thank you. Um, well, my question was, do you think counter-narrative um, will be an effective way to uh, combat IS? Um, as we all know, IS uses a, a strong uh, propaganda to, um, to recruit uh, foreign fighters, um, to mobilize them, um, and using the internet, uh, by using uh, videos, they have a strong narrative and strong story, uh, well, yeah, to mobilize them. and. Um, that's a huge problem, uh, as we uh, all can see, and um, there's a debate going on if we uh, have to use a counter-narrative in order to um, fight uh, IS, and um, the uh, European Union even uh, started a, a some kind of initiative to uh, make videos in order to counter the narrative of IS. So, uh, my question is if... if um, you think it's an effective way to uh, fight them uh, in a not military way? So, yeah, thank you. Um, good question. A question that is on the agenda of a lot of governments. They look into the possibilities, and I, I saw Efrat nodding, but I'm not sure if you agree. So, um, if you were responsible for, or if this this question was on your table. Uh, do you think, could you develop a strong counter-narrative, or do you think it's hopeless, And or if you see some opportunities, what, what will be the opportunity, what, we, what will be the narrative to fight the narrative, or to deal with the narrative of uh, the story, the propaganda of Islamic State? Well, I do agree that they do have a very strong ISIS as a as a group. Uh, they do have a very strong propaganda media uh, uh, bombarding these young kids. Uh, basically, they're portraying like this is a game, like Mortal Kombat. You're coming here having Call of Duty game, um, and maybe that is why these young kids are attracted to that. I'm feeling. The problem with this is that a uh, trying as a Western government to contra-attack that propaganda that is based on religion, because we have to also understand that their point of view is based on religion. They are moving all these foreign fighters based on religion. So on a Western side, if you are not a Muslim and you do not understand what is Islam or what is the Quran or what it says, trying to make a propaganda to counterattack, 
someone that is moving a mass based on religion is quite difficult because they will say, oh, the Western, they just want to uh, make us believe that our religion is evil, is bad, uh, they are saying something that is uh, not appropriate. So maybe if all the Western countries try to make an alliation with Islamic scholars within the country and try to attack that uh, media from ISIS and all this propaganda on the Islamic side that they say, look, this is Islam, I am a Muslim scholar, I am a Muslim, I know what is going on, you are doing completely wrong. Maybe it could work in the future, in the long run. But trying to see it from an outside perspective is going to be a little bit difficult. So we basically try to eradicate that people keep moving because of their faith and going and joining them, especially young. When you are young, you don't believe what your parents says. It's the same. You don't believe what adults says or people that are even there says. Thank you. Well, it should be mentioned that, that some of the leading scholars, or which are regarded like uh, prestigious scholars in Egypt, for instance, have come out with these kind of statements. But there are other ones that are more active on the internet that will have a different following uh, that say the, the, the uh, that come up with different kind of statement that support the violent jihad. So it, it's difficult, and it, it should be meant, it should be stressed here that a number of key scholars have spoken out against this violent jihad and it's not up to you uh, to um, to go to Syria and uh, Iraq but as you said uh, some of these especially younger kids they well they don't do not listen or they do not recognize the uh, prestigious uh, background of these people and and they they are cherry picking uh, whatever they find on the on the internet so it's, it's, I guess it's a, it's, it's a little bit more difficult than a little bit difficult. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure then if uh, Western governments can come up with these kind of answers. Uh, but they're trying. Um, other reactions to that? Uh, maybe Jason, do you think um, the Canadian uh, authorities can come up with a, 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 a counter narrative that will stop one or two or 20 or all potential foreign fighters? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I'll say this much. Uh, one, I mean, there, that's not really, at least from what I've seen so far, doesn't really seem to be an option on the table. Um, they, we seem to be more trying to get uh, Muslim uh, communities in the country involved, you know, to get us, you know, get them to, and I mean, it, it's not even, not, not very hard to do, you know, but to get them to help us to, to educate, you know, the youth in their own communities of why joining IS is a terrible idea. Um, so, you know, long story short, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure that's been considered. I imagine it maybe has at higher levels, but I will say this much, and I think Ifrat brings up an excellent point um, with regards to, you know, the target audience of counter narratives, and that is that we really do have to understand our target. We have to know what makes these people tick because, um, you know, if 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 the counter narrative is is you know if the intent is to dissuade their opinion to get them you know to to uh, to help you know, make them lose you know to to or well to get ISIS to lose hearts and minds or even to scare these people we have to understand them and I'm not I'm not sure we do and I mean not only that even if we do look at the resolve of some of these people some of these people are are, are dead set again you know about, about, about you know, dying for the caliphate. How do you how do you influence somebody like that, right? So it's it's certainly a challenge. Um, I think counter narratives could be uh, could be effective, but you know we really 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 have to understand the target before uh, before we could expect that to work. Yeah, I agree. And uh, having talked to a number of people that we didn't know then, but in the end left for Syria, uh, one that also died there. Uh, this guy, this guy uh, that, that any narrative, counter narrative, would not have worked. He was so convinced that he should go there and may and, and maybe even die there, and then in the end he he did. Um, and I think most counter narratives are not aimed at that group. They're aimed at uh, sympathizers, people that just flirt with IS that are not that serious yet. Um, and maybe it's also good to have uh, a narrative um, uh, to explain what's going on, as Efrat has said, 
try to explain to a general public, uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, what is going on there and why um, IAS uh, is in fact a wrong name for that organization, Islamic State, because uh, uh, actually they, they are against a lot of principles that most Muslims uh, stand for. So uh, I think sometimes that the counter-narrative um, that governments, especially Western governments, might uh, want to develop are more uh, or should maybe aimed at the general public, try to explain what's going on. Uh, I think might be a bit too hopeful if you think you can really stop those diehards from going. And at the same time, we see an enormous need for among a general public to try to understand what's going on, to what extent it is a thing that is related to Islam, because it is it has a link to Islam, and to what extent this is not the case, and 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 that there's other versions of Islam, um, and and a lot of people that are against IS, actually fighting against IS in Syria and Iraq, and they're also Muslims, and they die uh, by the thousands uh, because of the activities of IS. So counter-narrative also depends, I guess, uh, against uh, what audience do you have in mind, and maybe we should think about a general audience, uh, perhaps more than those uh, diehards. Um, so, are there any more questions, or do you have a pressing question uh, that popped up while you were uh, listening to what was going on? Uh, well, there was one question a bit linked to this of, uh, this issue of counterneurs is by Ziad Abdul Kadir, <laughs> if I pronounce it correctly. But he says that he thinks the the counter narrative is not working because we only see Kurdish people fighting IS. So he really takes um, it one step further from counter narratives to really be active in the fight against IS. So I'm not sure if, uh, no, how can we see that? Is that also, should that also be a goal of a counter-narrative? Well, it could be a goal to mobilize people to go out and fight there, and of course some do. People uh, join the ranks of Kurdish groups, uh, not only from uh, uh, other parts of the Middle East, but also Western countries. There was even a German girl, 19 years old, killed last week who was with a left-wing organization that joined the ranks of the Kurds. So, uh, But we do see, um, and I think partly unfortunately, lots of sectarian groups, uh, uh, Shia from Afghanistan, uh, Yemen, Iraq joining groups in Syria, all kinds of Sunnis joining, of course, uh, IS and other militias, and this foreign involvement by many different people is making, I think, the problem even bigger. So. Personally, I would not be in favor of uh, attracting even more people to that region to fight, uh, making any possible future negotiation peace impossible. Um, uh, but there's a lot more people that go and join uh, and that are foreign fighters than just Sunni Muslims joining IS. Um, um, so in that sense, um, the problem is even a lot bigger than uh, just simply IS. Um, we're almost at 7 o'clock uh, Leiden time, so uh, time for me to thank um, the participants of this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you, Jason, Darren, Efrat, Louise, and also thank you, Janine, for um, uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, very difficult, uh, well, very interesting questions, that are difficult to answer, uh, but I hope that this way, by discussing these sensitive and difficult issues with uh, people from around the globe with different backgrounds, different uh, uh, geographical backgrounds and whatever backgrounds you have, I think that's the way we, we need to somehow to find out how we deal with IS, foreign fighters, an issue which I'm afraid will be on the agenda for the coming years. So um, this is definitely not the end of the discussion but just the start and I hope you'll join us in, uh, in a future discussion. So again, Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion, and uh, well, all the best, and I hope to see you uh, another time in one of the Coursera uh, courses that we uh, provide at Leiden University. Thank you very much.